Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Today, we speak with Dr. Joe Lyons, an industrial organizational psychologist with the Air Force Research Laboratory. We'll discuss human-machine interaction, trust, and whether robots are going to take over the world. In three, two, one. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So a question for you. So we I just mentioned you're working on human machine interaction and trust. Um, is that kind of like trusting autonomous cars or having Alexa in your home? Yeah, so certainly things like autonomous cars, things like Amazon Alexa, these are very high profile uh, technologies that people interact with on a regular basis. So it's kind of like that. So we look at trying to understand what are the things that would make a person more or less likely to get into an autonomous car, to interact with Alexa in ways that are very um, socially oriented or task focused. You know, what are the different things that people look for in driving their trust up or down in relation to all sorts of technologies. And that can be interesting to kind of quantify. So how do you test that for people? Yeah, so typically the state of the art in the area of trust is we use a lot of subjective or survey measures for measuring trust. Um, the, are these perfect? No, they have their limitations, but it's kind of the state of the art. There are folks working on uh, other things, things like physiological indices to try to get at constructs like trust. There's a great deal of legacy in looking at things like workload in using these sorts of metrics. We also use behavioral metrics. So if you're trusting of a person or a technology, you're going to act in a way that's trusting or distrusting of that entity, whether, it, whether it's a person or a technology. And so we try to build those into our studies as well in whatever ways are appropriate for that particular study. Okay. So this could mean things like reliance behaviors, taking suggested guidance from a piece of technology, interacting with it with humor. Uh, in the case of Alexa, could be an example of, of trusting or exploration. So. Is that something you see people react better to, is humor, or is that just one of, like you mentioned, a well, subcategory? Well, there are certainly social aspects of human-machine interaction that come into play. Humor could be one of the elements, but people are actually susceptible to cognitive biases that are associated with technology in ways that we do with humans. We have those same sorts of fallacies or, or heuristics that we use when we interact with technologies. And what are some of the examples of those? Yeah, so if, uh, if a piece of technology, for instance, goes out of its way to what might be uh, described as helping you. Mm -hmm. You're gonna exert more effort in relation to that. So one of the areas that I'm really interested in is this idea of social intent from machines. You think about a, a robotic system or an intelligent agent of some kind, if it construes uh, or if it conveys a positive social intent in relation to you, how does that impact your trust of the machine? Does it make you feel kind of used and abused? Does it make you feel supported? Because if we look at the interpersonal trust literature, a lot of the things that drive whether we trust a person or not is your intentions in relation to me. Are your intentions good or bad, right? The same sorts of things I think are gonna hold for machines, but for machines that have both the authority to act and the capabilities to act on our behalf. It's not gonna be for all machines, of course. <laughs> And, and then so some of the work you're doing with the Air Force, why do we, the Air Force, care about human-machine interaction? Well, certainly, why do we care about human-machine interaction? If you look at where the Air Force is headed with the 2030 study that just recently came out, there's all sorts of human-machine interaction examples and needs that are kind of spelled out within that. Some of those, I actually wrote a couple of these down. So some of these involve things like rapid and effective decision making. So using machines to help us make better decisions and faster decisions, getting inside the decision cycle of our adversaries. We're gonna need intelligent agents, we're gonna need machines to help with that. But how do we do this effectively? How do we do this in ways where we don't put too much reliance on technology but just enough? That This is the whole notion of human machine teaming. Leveraging the strengths of all parties, including the technologies and the humans, and also trying to mitigate or limit the weaknesses of those, because obviously machines aren't perfect, humans aren't perfect, so trying to get the optimal synergy between the two is really where the Air Force is headed. And that, what you just mentioned with the rapid and effective decision making, is that more in simulation form, or is this gonna be technology people could, you'd say, have in the field that would give them a, a reading of, you said, like maybe 
what an adversary could be doing at that moment and kind of give them live updates of what they could react to. I think in the long term we'd like to get to that spot, but I don't think we're anywhere close to that at this okay. point from an adversary standpoint. So right now it's all like you're kind of working in simulation and like this could be, or we're kind of building up to that. Point. Well, we're working in simulation and in some cases we're working with real systems. Okay. And so right now then, in terms of like what you guys are working on, is there any examples you can touch on uh, success stories you've had with uh, human machine interaction? Yeah, so one uh, area that I'll talk about a little bit is I had some previous work, uh, actually a, a three year program, uh, looking at trust of the automatic ground collision avoidance system. This is the safety system that the Air Force fielded in 2014. And it's recently encountered for a great deal of number of saves uh, within the Air Force, which is great. It's, it's doing very well. But when it was fielded in 2014, the operational community wasn't really sure how pilots were going to react to this new system that now had the authority and the ability to act on the behalf of the pilots. When it detected that it would, the, the aircraft was facing an imminent collision with the ground, the system would automatically take control, right the aircraft, and then give control back to the pilot. A new concept. Yeah. Uh, but it's working out very well. And so what we did within this study was we went out all over the world. This was a great deal of, of travel. It was kind of hard on the family for a little bit. But we went out to, and talked to operational fighter pilots. And we tried to understand, here's this new automated system. What are the factors about this system that you trust or distrust? And we followed it for several years. And at the end of the day, we spoke to upwards of six to 700 fighter pilots oh, wow. through surveys and interviews and got a really good grasp of what are the factors that influence trust of this particular technology. And so what we look for are kind of those broad categories of things that will influence trust across a variety of platforms, but also the specific guidance for that particular technology that we can use to go back with the engineers and actually make the system a little bit better. Yeah, because that's definitely a pretty extreme case for a lot of people, because you imagine what people are most afraid of is literally losing control of the right. machine. <laughs> so what did you find then for the Auto G cast, like you mentioned? Uh, was that really the biggest fear? Just what if we don't get control back? Yeah, there's certainly a great deal of concern regarding um, the loss of control, especially early on when the system was just fielded. Uh, there were also some uh, technology hurdles that the system had to overcome. So when it was fielded, it wasn't perfect, and it's, it's not perfect today, but it's a very good, reliable system. But these imperfections are what the pilots would be concerned about. So what if the system made a mistake? What if it caused a problem? Fortunately, we haven't run into a lot of this, the uh, situations where it's making a, a lot of mistakes, but there were some errors that the systems made. And so these were the key things that were driving some of the distrust of, of pilots. Whereas if you look at the situation now, for this particular technology, I would classify it as there's broad acceptance. There's overwhelming, I would even call it universal acceptance of the technology because it's had such a strong performance track record. And when you start to show pilots, hey, this thing is actually saving lives, and you can show them videos of the actual saves, it's an instant game changer. So we can apply those lessons learned to other technologies that get fielded in the future and help communicate to engineers, designers, practitioners, these are the sorts of things that make trust improve. Yeah. These are some of the things you might want to avoid. Right. Do you think that as time moves on, you know, someone in, in your situation in five or ten years, they're going to be dealing with a new kind of generation of fighter pilots that grew up with uh, a different level of trust and autonomy? I'm thinking about, you know, I have a three-year-old cousin and she goes up to her minivan and says, Alexa, open the doors. Now, I don't know that she could do that with her, her car, <laughs> but she's growing up thinking that she can talk to the air. So if we have the next generation of war fighters, what do we expect um, their expectations are going to be with uh, interacting with humans and machines? I absolutely think that there's going to be some generational effects. So this is actually a question I get quite often from folks about, hey, what about the next generation? Are they just going to blindly trust everything? I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. I'm not sure that the new generations are going to blindly trust everything, but what's going to be different are their expectations. Their ways of doing work are going to be different. The ways that they execute a mission are going to be different, and technology is going to be a big part of that. And so whether that means that they develop new relationships with technology, I absolutely I think that's going to be the case. But I don't necessarily think it's going to be blind trust like a lot of people are concerned about, because these folks are growing up with the technologies, and in many cases, they may know some of the limitations of the technologies more than some of the more experienced folks. 
And kind of looking at um, the grand scope, that's a good idea to see how much of an impact you've had with your work. But what does uh, your day to day kind of look like? What, how do you kind of implement all this? My day to day, yeah. So my day to day is never the same, which <laughs> is one of the reasons I love working for AFRL because yeah, it keeps it exciting. there's such a, a variety of, of job requirements. And <laughs> yeah, when I try to tell people, well, when I try to tell people about my typical day, it's always back to the same. There's never a typical day. So some some days I'm collecting data, some days I'm analyzing data, some days I'm unfortunately stuck in uh, wall-to-wall meetings, <laughs> but that happens. Uh, some days I'm writing papers. I mean, it it varies considerably. So, but again, I think that's one of the things that I like about this job that um, I've never been bored. <laughs> Yeah, and how did you get to this point then? Did you kind of plan from the beginning to be working with machines in this capacity, or did you kind of find this position? So I joined AFRL back in 2005. When I first came into AFRL, I was actually doing research that was more organizational in nature. So I, I led a research team called Organizational Effectiveness, and we did a bunch of organizational surveys, we did some organizational redesign work, and we dabbled a little bit in the trust area. It wasn't something that I came into AFRL with the interest uh, in doing human-machine interaction. It just so happens the Air Force has a lot of technologies that are really exciting and really cool. And so it, it, in some ways it, it kind of just happened that way. But so I came in in 2005. I was a team lead for organizational effectiveness for, I would say, up until around 2010, 2011, because in 2011 I was asked to go off to AFOSR, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and be a program officer for a period of time. During that time as a program officer, I really doubled down on my interest in the trust domain. Um, these interests were broader than just human-machine trust. They were also human-human trust interests. But I spent several years in the DC area rubbing shoulders with some of the top folks uh, in academia and in some cases industry. And it really helped my interests in human-machine trust really blossom because I got to see what's, well, what's the state of the art right now in this field. And that's a lot of stuff you said was fielded your way, or you just saw different research projects dabbling in machine? I saw, in that case, a largely a lot of academic projects that okay. were going on in this space. But I also got to talk to a lot of the folks in the Air Force about where's the Air Force headed in this area. I got exposed to some new technologies, and I brought those interests back with me in 2013 when I really chartered a new group to focus on this human-machine trust problem. So you were really there at the advent of it then? Like you, you said you kind of pitched it here, or that was already a burgeoning group that you It was really a group that I was, fortunately, with the leadership that I had, um, they empowered me to build a new team to kind of focus on Okay, that gotcha. Back. That's a pretty big deal. That's great. And that's the same team you've been working with now, or that's kind of changed over the years? That's the same team, largely, that I work with now. I'm, I'm, so I've recently uh, gone through some, well, the directorate has gone through some reorganizations. And so I'm currently in a group that does still human-machine interaction work, um, but I still do a lot of the human-machine trust work. I work okay. with that same group as well. And with that then, um, so a lot of people have different like, ideas around what machine learning entails. And we've kind of discussed what you've done personally, but what are some common misconceptions you've picked up on, let's say through your surveys, that you kind of want to dissuade here? Some of the, the myths maybe about yeah, human-machine yeah. trust. Well, one of the things that I think is really kind of interesting with regard to human-machine interaction, human-machine trust, there are asymmetries that exist between how we view interactions with people and how we view interactions with machines. So typically with machines, we have really high expectations about performance. So we think we're gonna get this system right out of the box and it's gonna work perfectly, which of course never happens. Whereas with people, we're much more forgiving um, maybe we just know that everyone has limitations and whatnot, but uh, a great example I'll give you is the domain of autonomous cars, right? So driving on the highway ourselves is one of the riskiest things we will ever do in our lives, given the number of accidents that occur and the number of people that die on highways every year. Uh, we may not want to think about that, but that's one of the realities of our, the risk that we take in our lives. There are lots of people that unfortunately die on the highways every year. We don't hear much about that. But the second that an autonomous car, quote, kills someone, it's all over the news. It's, it's something that we, we have this asymmetry. So technology, we don't expect to ever do that. And it's not really acceptable for us, for technology to, to cause errors like that. But it happens. It's going to happen even more the more technologies that get out there. There are going to be mistakes that happen. But our expectations of the technologies are such that 
we're not as tolerant about that as we are about when humans make mistakes. So maybe we should flip-flop those, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's interesting, because <laughs> ultimately humans are creating the machines at this exactly. point. Um, so there would be some imperfections and as we evolve. That made me wonder too, do you have a lot of like ethics concerns in the work you do? You talk about autonomous cars, you, you think about the scenarios of, you know, this, this car could make this choice or this choice that has an ethical implica implication. Does that happen in your work as well? So the area where I would touch on in that is looking more at the tolerance levels for different scenarios. So if a machine made decision X that caused Y, how are people's tolerances going to change based on certain parameters of why that just happened, for example. So again, one of my big areas of interest is this notion of transparency with machines. So transparency is kind of all about shared awareness and shared intent between humans and machines. So think about a robotic system. If a robotic system went out and hurt somebody, we'd really want to know why that happened. And this kind of gets at the transparency aspect. So I would be interested in understanding what are the things that humans, A, need to know, and really um, what are the factors that drive their trust of that robot from a transparency standpoint? Because it's kind of all about why did that just happen? What's the rationale? What's the programming of, this, of, the, of the system, whether it's a robotic system or a form of automation? And again, I'm really kind of interested in this notion of social intent. If we can design these systems to really have our best interests in mind, how do we create those affordances for the humans interacting with the systems so that there's a better teaming relationship between the two? If yeah. that makes sense. Because I've seen, like, in terms of what you're saying, like examples of people, at least in terms of trust and reliability, like almost humanizing machines. Like maybe not full Android level, but giving them voices, kind of like Alexa, personality, mm -hmm. humor. Um, so is that something that I kind of touched on the humor earlier, but getting even a face to this machine, you see that helps more so than just having a, let's say, a bank of monitors people talk to? Well, whether or not it helps, I think, is an empirical question for that task context. But what we do know is that it makes an impact. Okay. It impacts things like trust, liking, whether they are approach-oriented towards the machine or not. So real simple, simple anthropomorphic cues like a face, a picture, those have an impact. So what we should think about from an Air Force standpoint what are the impacts that we want to have? Uh, what makes sense? Because what we don't want to do is create all these expectations that aren't real. You don't want to create the expectation that something's more anthropomorphic than it really is. Because that creates expectations about how well it's going to perform, how, how it's going to interact with us. So I would say our research focuses not so much on should you do these things or not, but what's the impact of doing these things. So you're saying if you had a more realistic interface, like a really realistic human, people would um, think that that since it looks so real, it will provide a better experience back to me as opposed to I'm thinking back to Clippy, the paper clip on right. my Microsoft Word documents where I really didn't expect a lot out of this paper clip because it didn't right. didn't look like a That's you know a professional. Is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. So what I'm saying is that when you create those surface level cues, they create expectations about how the technology could work, how, how effective it is, what sorts of interactions it's going to have with you as a person. And if those real affordances aren't built into the system, we probably should avoid those surface cues to avoid people becoming too reliant on the technologies. It should, so our work, yeah, we look at trust, but we look at what we call appropriate trust, calibrated trust, trust that's actually warranted. Because what we want to avoid, especially within the Air Force, is a situation where people are too reliant on technology, but the inverse is, can also be problematic. So going back to the GCAS example, if people would have constantly shut the system off when it was fielded because they didn't trust it at all, obviously that's bad and wasteful as well. So we try to find that happy balance between distrust and suspicion and blind trust. So there's some happy medium for each technology that we aspire to try to understand. Yeah, and it sounds like there's a middle ground you're working on with the Auto GCAS, for example, where you're saying a lot of people were uh, distrustful until you either spoke to them or literally showed a video saying, hey, like this is what it does and practice and we've seen this save lives. Do you see that usually the real video does better than, let's say, a simulation or even just something that you write up and give to someone? Like they need to see this working? From an Air Force operator standpoint, there's no substitute for a real live video. <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't sure how you're kind of working on helping with that, because let's say there's still a prototype you're working on, you may not have a real video. Like, how do you so, guys kind of approach Yeah, it? so things you could rely on there are things like how the system works. So giving them that background on how the technology works gets them more familiar with the technology. Um, showing them any kind of simulated performance data 
if that's all you have, that's where you start from. So that's an important thing to think about. Um, I know with Auto GCasts, the pilots really liked a lot of the engineering data. Yeah. When when you when they could actually see, oh, here's where the system kicked in, here's where the pilot actually kicked in, and you can see some of the trade-offs with that. So data goes a long way. But absolutely, and I think this is going to be true with uh, any really advanced form of, of automation, videos, real live data, they're game changers. <laughs> when you think about the concept of trust. Yeah, absolutely. The inverse could also be true. It could generate a lot of distrust if it's showing something bad. Yes, it's always like you said, that one moment where you catch an autonomous car crashing, like the right. one thing that goes wrong, people do really focus on it. So if, with that example too, let's say if that happened with one of your systems, what's a way you guys have used to combat that? Like let's say you have one negative press thing come out, but you've had largely more success. Is that just again the data that helps back it up? Or? The data would back it up and also kind of highlighting why the system erred in that particular instance. So yeah. was it a hardware issue? Was it a software issue? Did the operator do something they weren't supposed to do? So being able to, in that case, when a system does make a mistake, which again is going to happen in all cases just about, um, being able to highlight why this is, the situation happened is really important. And do you see, um, with the rise of a lot more intelligent AI and different systems working, is that a major piece that you're working with as well, or even in five years, seeing that being a huge part of the Air Force? Well, I certainly, it can, for me, it goes back to the ideas of transparency. Mm -hmm. What are the transparency factors that matter? How can we institute them with particular technologies? So I think it's going to be really important, absolutely. Certainly because within the Air Force, you see the potential for more capable systems that are given more decision authority. In those situations, I think it's the perfect storm for potential trust issues, either too little or too much. Both are problematic. Because if the Air Force is spending all this money on a new tech, you don't want it sitting on a shelf. You also don't want people relying on it too much in very high consequence situations. Yeah, that's a divide not many people know exists because there's got to be that, you got to dance on both sides, you're right. You can't rely too much, but you can't not use it. You also want people coming in with a little bit of healthy skepticism at first. Absolutely, no, that makes sense. <laughs> and uh, kind of along those lines then, kind of on a, a fun note, is there any piece, let's say, of uh, machine learning that you, or machine learning, excuse me, um, with machine interaction that you kind of like at home with like an Alexa or autonomous car, for example, something that you've seen in other industries that you think is very cool? Something that I have in my home, you said? Or? Yeah, yeah, something you may be a fan uh, well, of. Well, we certainly have Alexa. Nice. Um, I, I find it interesting how my kids interact with it. They're always asking it to tell jokes and asking it funny questions. and. Um, you know, it's it's a cool technology, but it's limited as well. I mean, so it's going to have the the set of, uh, of parameters that it's been programmed to, to operate under, and that's that's fine. What I find interesting with it is, though, one of the areas of research that we look at is this notion of human machine teaming. What is a human machine team? How can we define it? And more importantly, what are the components that make a person more or less likely to view a piece of technology as a teammate versus a tool? The really rich dialogue that Alexa has is an example of a dimension that people talk about as being, hey, this might be more teammate-like. In fact, we've done some studies uh, to ask people, what are some technologies that you think are more of a teammate? What are some technologies that you think are more tool-like? And Alexa does come up as one of those things that's a little bit more teammate-like. And we think largely because of this rich dialogue, the interactive nature, it can tell jokes. You know, the, the, there's more of a social affordance to it relative to some other technologies. Yeah. You might actually say thank you. Yeah, you might say thank end, you. They don't care. <laughs> right. Zeros and ones. But mm -hmm. There's something nice about that. Like I've said to my phone before when I ask for help, I say thank you. It says no problem. And I kind of like that. You know, it kind of reassures them like it is listening to me. There's that dialogue. It's, it's more interactive in that sense, yeah. And is that something then, like, I'm glad you touched on this. I remember you mentioning before about the teaming. Is the stuff we're working on here a mix of both, you said, kind of like we do have tools we're using and machine teaming, or are we more focusing on the machine teaming aspect? So that's an interesting question. I think we certainly have a lot of automated tools that the Air Force and the military in general is, is going to use, but we're certainly working on technologies that might be more teammate focused. And if you look at where the Air Force wants to go in some of its strategic doctrine, whether it's Autonomous Horizons, the second volume that came out, or the 2030 study, human-machine teaming is really an important aspect of the future for the Air Force because that suggests that the humans are going to be a critical part of all of our operations. The humans are going to be a critical part of the decision process. So again, what we need to focus on is not 
technology to replace humans, but technology to augment humans, to make us get the best out of the humans that we can possibly get, and also to get the best out of our technologies, right? Because there's a great deal of capabilities that exist for processing, computation, that humans can never do, just because we don't have the, the right hardware to do that the same at the space, at the same um, scale and pace of some of the technology. So leveraging the best of both and trying to limit the weaknesses of both is where we think and where we need to go. That's a great call out because our podcast, we often ask about the technologies, but it's really about the people behind it. And your work is about enhancing performance of humans. Absolutely. Whether it's enhancing a decision, whether it's enhancing some operation that they're doing, it's absolutely about making the overall system better. And the system includes the human and the technology, as well as the work. <laughs> And I'm guessing that's a big part of when you explain trust to people, saying, hey, it's not just the machine doing the full load, you're part of the system. Like, you are. Absolutely. In a role, yeah. And just kind of an example to clarify that. So you were saying in terms of, let's say, machine teaming. So with the rapid and effective decision making, that's more of a team then? Like, you're working with this device, you could say, to kind of formulate a strategy? Or is that more of a tool? Well, I think it could be either. Okay. And I think in reality, we're going to have combinations of things. So there's going to be lots of times where we interact with technologies, and yeah, most of the time they just might be tool-like. I just need an answer. I need some level of support. Gives me that answer. Gives me that support. In really complex situations, are going to be the times where the human machine teams come into play, where you're not sure what's out there. You're not sure always what the best approach might be. But through the combination of the computational power of the technologies, and your own kind of naturalistic decision, decision making and pattern recognition, you can say, hey, well, based on what I know, here's the best path forward, if that makes sense. And that's kind of the vision, I think, of where the Air Force is headed. Yeah, so I might be totally off base, but um, I'm kind of a sci-fi geek, and this makes you really think of a lot of things like having AI with you, like let's say built in a suit, kind of building out a battle plan for you, like, hey, this might be the best approach A, adapting with you versus approach B, and you can kind of, you as a human, decide where to go. Sure, I think that's a, a, a great vision, and. I know there are people working on technologies that can help augment our memory, you know, because they, they don't have the same limitations we have for working memory and whatnot. So they can have a, a constant, uh, you know, memory of the battlefield and what's been going on, what's been done in the past, what are some potential options and courses of action for the future. In fact, the group that I'm currently working in now, they're working on a lot of uh, machine intelligence to enhance decision making. So being able to present a, an operator with different courses of action to show here are some options for you. Here are potential trade-offs for each of these options. This is one of the areas that I think is really important is, again, going back to transparency, if you're presented with five different courses of action, why is one better than another? What are the, the pros and cons of each of these? You know, this is where I think a lot of the machine interaction can really help us because it can present those options to us really rapidly to say, hey, here's the pros and cons. You make the decision, but here are your options. So it actually gives the operator the decision to weight, weight the pros and cons instead of building in some kind of algorithm to say that this factor is more important than that and here's your, here's your answer. I would say it gives the human the option to weight different pros and cons. It also gives the human the option to choose based on those pros and cons. So the machines may be giving you some sense of um, priorities based on your goals, for okay. instance, but the human's still in, in the um, decision maker seat for sure. And with that then, um, so kind of talking about cool technology I'm working on, um, a question we'd love to ask people who are on our podcast is, uh, in terms of a uh, piece of technology and a researcher, is there anybody who helped motivate you or anybody who um, like maybe idolized when you were younger that you thought was really cool that may have worked in the Air Force or even now? That's a great question. Um, so, so I've always liked sci-fi. So whether you're talking about a robotic system or some sort of alien movies or whatnot, I've always been a big fan of sci-fi. So that's... I think the Air Force is a lot closer to the technologies than maybe some of other groups. But yeah, in terms of who I idolize, I, I mean, I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> it's fine, yeah, no, I yeah. thought I'd just throw it out there, but um, that is something really cool you touch on, because that's something, especially working with the labs now, I've seen you, right, that sci-fi element, like I mentioned just a few questions ago, really is apparent. Most people don't know, like this, for instance, human-machine interaction, people don't really think about that teaming and how that is kind of stuff that we've seen in films in the past, but is happening today. Right, right. Yeah, well, and a lot of sci-fi writers do have a, like, a fundamental science background, yeah. too, because yeah. they're imagining the future. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of our sci-fi films end up with the the robots taking over the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, have you ever been fielded like iRobot questions or anything like the laws of robotics? So that gets back to the whole notion of machine ethics. Okay. And so, how do you design if you if you give a machine the authority to make a decision, the ethics issue comes into play, because you're gonna want to understand when it's gonna make certain kinds of decisions versus others. When it does make a decision, you're gonna want to understand why. So traceability, kind of. And um, being able to interrogate a, a behavior, these are going to be really important features for any new AI system that the Air Force builds, because people are going to want that information. They're going to want to know why. Yeah, and that, is that have you done preliminary questioning then, or at least gone along that path, asking people what level of uh, even control a machine should have, like kind of going into this machine ethics? Well, so we've again we've done some work on the notions of transparency and what are the the facets of transparency that might influence a person's level of acceptance uh, for a particular machine. So we've done, for example, some, some work on scripted autonomous security robots. So oh. when you get, when you, uh, imagine you're going into an airport, instead of a TSA person, you get a robot that says, okay, show me your, your boarding pass, show me your ID, you know, okay, you're good to go, or you're, nope, you're not authorized, you gotta stay out here in the, in the sterile area. We've developed some studies to create some situations like that which create uh, an opportunity for us to test out different kinds of transparency. And so that's some of the current research that I'm doing. And it's using uh, video stimuli, but real robots with real people uh, that are serving as kind of research confederates, if you will, to kind of give uh, an impression, here's a real robot doing something to a real person. It's not simulated, it's not a game. So that's some of our current research. Yeah, because a lot of people could have, when they think that, they might think it's silly, like, oh, a robot can't tell me what to do, I need a person here. <laughs> so would the first idea with that, would you kind of have a machine paired team then, like have somebody overlooking these machines, or is the dream to hopefully just have these run on their own? Well, so there could be lots of different ways you could do it. Uh, our studies are assuming more of a to an autonomous robot, because that's kind of what we were focused on. Yeah. In practice, yes, of course, you'd probably want someone with the oversight behind the robot to say, hey, you know, this person's okay, let them, let them pass. Especially if you were looking into more DOD-centric sorts of things like sentry robots or you know, guard robots, you know, things like that. Super interesting. Yeah. Uh, it kind of almost brings us to one of our fan questions from Twitter. Dr. Leslie Blaha said, what can we learn about human behavior by studying how we interact with machines? She posed this question to you and I, I kind of think we're touching on how people would react to um, machines and then what do we learn about them? Yeah, so I appreciate the, the question, Leslie. Um, so what can we learn about human behavior by studying human-machine interaction? I think one of the key things we can learn are the biases that we have when interacting with machines. So how do we do this? How do we do this in a way that's different from how we interact with people? What are the things that are you know the, the same? What are some of the things that are different? I think the biases area is, is certainly one of the areas that we can learn we can take lessons learned from our machine interactions and see if we can apply them elsewhere. And of course, trying to understand effective ways of interacting, that's always the, the end state, right? We're, we're looking for ways to make the humans better performers in different contexts, and so those are certain, certainly gonna be lessons learned for different uh, technologies. Yeah, and that's something as you touched on as we go ahead and start implementing these, it's just a matter of taking data from how people either interact with them or again from surveys we take beforehand. So it's good to see with people in your position, we at least have a very good idea of how a technology should be accepted. Because most people don't even know how this process works. They assume it's just kind of like autonomous cars. They assume it's just a lot of testing uh, by different companies behind the scenes. But now we have a face to that. <laughs> so we definitely appreciate you coming out here and really talking about what this kind of uh, encapsulates. It's kind of hard sometimes to, like I mentioned way earlier, quantify and think about how it works. Sure. Yeah. Well, again, appreciate the invite. Yeah, do you have any final thoughts you want to share with people about either, again, common myths or just uh, things going forward that you're looking forward to in this field? So common myths regarding human-machine interactions. So I would say um, the people that are concerned about robots taking over the world, we've got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just Google some of the DARPA robot challenge videos. It'll be kind of comical. But we're working on some really cool things. So um, I don't think we have to worry about the robots taking over anytime soon, but there's promise for where we're headed with machine interactions and artificial intelligence, there's, um, I think we'll see some cool things in our lifetime, for sure. 
It's great. So we should be able to sleep tonight. You know, the robots aren't taking. Rest away. assured, folks. <laughs> yeah, I robots not happening. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> not, not on our watch. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thanks again. If you'd like to learn more about how the Air Force Research Laboratory is working on human performance, check out afresearchlab.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off. <laughs>